Hi folks, and welcome to Intermediate Bird Identification. I'm Leanne Latchmoy from Birds Canada here in Saskatoon. This video was made in part to support participation in the Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas, a citizen science project that aims to determine the status and distribution of birds that nest across the province. Today, we're gonna to be talking about gulls and terns. So this workshop focuses on birds that nest here in Saskatchewan, and these are gonna be the ones that you are commonly going to be seeing during the breeding season, and adults in breeding plumage are shown. So we're gonna be covering five species of gulls and three species of tern. All right, so taking a look at gulls and terns together, gulls have a slightly curved bill, and these are the birds here on the left. They are bulky overall, and these guys wander far from nesting colonies in order to forage in other habitats. So you're going to see birds far away from water, um, which is typically where they nest. Um, they'll tend to nest on isolated sandbars or islands in bodies of water. Um, there's also great plumage variation based on age in gulls, and some take up to four years to actually reach this lovely adult plumage that we're seeing here. Terns, on the other hand, are smaller and more slender than gulls. They've got narrower, pointier wings, and they've got kind of finer pointed bills. These guys will also wander far from colonies in order to forage. So let's get started with the gulls. Now, conveniently, there's two groups that we can break them down into right off the bat, and those are black-headed and white-headed gulls. So sometimes, you know, you're out there and you're looking at, um, you know, gulls flying off in the distance, and chances of you being able to identify them down to species is, is pretty slim. Um, but you can still break them up into those two categories of black-headed gull or white-headed gull. And so, you know, even doing something like that is getting you a step closer to an identification. Let's take a look at our black-headed gulls first. So first up, we've got the Franklin's gull. This is a small gull with a black hood. It's got a bold, incomplete eye ring or eye arcs. You can see them right here on this bird. Very, very bold. Um, they're, they really stand out because they're quite bright white. It's got a slender, deep red bill. Now this deep red bill can be tough to see at a distance. Um, because it's so dark, it doesn't reflect a whole lot of light. So if you've got it at a distance or under poor light conditions, um, you might not actually pick up that it's red. So don't worry about it if you're seeing um, what you believe is a Franklin skull, but you can't actually see that red bill. Color in birds is actually, especially subtle colors and darker ones can be tough to tell um, because the way you perceive the color is gonna differ depending on the lighting conditions that you're viewing the bird in. Um, it's also got black markings on the tips of the wings and this will be useful for comparing to our other black-headed gull in flight. So again, those wings that look like they've just had the tips dipped in some black ink. And what's really nice is that adults in this fresh breeding plumage will often show a pinkish wash on their belly feathers. Um, you can sort of see it in this gull here down at the bottom. It's just got this like ever so slight kind of salmon pink wash to it. And um, I always find that's really, really pretty. Those, the tips of those feathers often get worn off pretty quickly as the breeding season um, wears on, but it's really nice kind of fresh birds to see. Um, you'll find these birds in wetlands, lakes, and they're often seen roosting on grid roads, and they will often follow around farm machinery, um, picking up everything that the, the farm machinery, machinery has disturbed. Um, these guys definitely nest in wetlands, so they'll nest in, in wetland vegetation, so you'll see them um, if you've got, you know, kind of shallow, great big cattail marsh, um, you might find a Franklin's gull colony in there. The similar looking Bonaparte's gull is another small gull with a black hood. It's got an incomplete eye ring, which is less prominent than the Franklin's gull. And it's got a slender black bill. But remember what I said about that, that bright red bill. Um, it can look dark at a distance. So, um, but this one does indeed have a fully black slender bill. And in flight, it's got a black band along the tips of the primaries. So that's that kind of trailing edge back here along the primary feathers. And it's got a prominent white wedge on the leading edge of those um, primary feathers as well. So we'll compare the two um, black-headed gulls in a second, but that black on the wing is on the trailing edge of the primary feathers. And this is actually a bird that you will find nesting in the boreal forest. And what's cool about this bird is they actually build stick nests in conifer trees, which is really interesting um, to see, you know, not many of us think about gulls as potentially something that nests in a tree. And so it's always interesting to, to see these birds on the breeding grounds. 
So let's take a look at the two of these birds compared. So we got Franklin's here on the left and Bonaparte's on the right. And you can see that difference in the eye arc um, stands out, but at a distance, that's going to be a tough um, field mark to pick out. So what I really suggest taking a look at is where the black is located on the wings. So on the Franklin's gull, remember the black is going to be primarily on the, the very, very tips. So it's going to look like the whole tip of the wing was, was dipped in black ink right down there. Whereas on the Bonapartes, there's going to be black along the leading, on the trailing edge of the primary feathers there. And there's also going to be this prominent white wedge. And you can see that contrasts a fair bit with the rest of the wing and um, upper back, which we call the mantle in gulls. Um, so the back um, upper portion here is really contrasting with that white leading edge. So that's the difference between Franklin's and Bonaparte's gulls. So um, actually quite a, a nice tidy little one to identify while it's flying at a distance. All right, let's venture into the white-headed gulls. First up, we've got the likely very familiar ring-billed gull. This is a medium-sized gull, so um, a fair bit larger than the black-headed gulls we just looked at. Now, it's got a pale gray mantle, so that's that, again, that portion of the, the wings and upper back. And it's got a dark ring that in, completely encircles the bill. It's also got a pale iris, so you'll note that it's not black. Um, it's, it's quite this um, pale yellow color. And it's got yellowish legs and feet. Now, leg and feet color in gulls can be really, really difficult, as well as um, gauging um, the paleness or darkness of the gray on the mantle of a gull. Um, like I mentioned before, lighting conditions are going to play a huge factor in your perception of these colors and also what you consider to be, you know, yellowish, greenish, um, you know, could be more yellowish to another person. So some of those colors are, are really tricky um, to, to pick out. And especially when you're looking at mantle color, it's really more helpful if you have several birds standing side by side in a, in a mixed flock. And then you can really pick out like, okay, yes, this one is darker than that one. And that's where those comparisons um, come in handy. And gulls will actually, um, especially the white-headed ones, will roost in these kind of communal roosting areas. So that's a good opportunity to go and take a look at multiple gull species all at once. Um, the habitat is large water bodies, and they're also found around human habitation quite a fair bit. So this is the gull that you will also see in the McDonald's parking lot, but they don't nest there. Let's, took, let's take a look at another similar white-headed gull, and that's the California gull. That's another medium-sized gull, but it is larger than ring-billed gull. So if you have the two side by side, um, it is definitely noticeable, um, the size difference between the two, the California gull being larger. And it's got a gray mantle. And again, that's more useful when you've got birds side by side. Um, it's got a red and black patch near the tip of the bill on the lower mandible. So unlike our ring-billed gull, it doesn't have color that encircles the bill completely. Instead, it's got this kind of distinctive red and black patch on the bottom of the bill. And it's also got a dark iris. So it's got a nice dark eye that you can see there. And it's kind of got yellow legs and feet, which tend to be in the kind of yellow to yellow greenish range. Um, these guys also inhabit large bodies of water, but you'll also find them hanging around human habitation as well. And next up, we've got the very large herring gull. So he's got a pale gray mantle. So um, the California gull is going to have the darker mantle of the three white-headed gulls we just looked at. He's got a red patch near the tip of the bill, um, but it's going to be less bold red typically, and you know there's not going to be that dark, um, that really bold dark patch to it as well. And he's going to have a pale iris, so um, we've got that that red patch and a pale iris here. Um, leg color in this case is useful because he's got kind of pink legs and feet, and so this contrasts a fair bit differently between the other ring-billed gull and California gull that you're going to be seeing. Um, this is a bird that's more commonly seen in the boreal forest during the breeding season, um, but it's definitely a common transient um, during the migration period, and sometimes you'll get birds that hang around for a while as well. So let's take um, a look at the heads of those three gulls side by side and review some of the field marks for them. So we got ring gull, California, and herring. So if we're taking a look at 
um, how the bill looks. We've got a black ring that encircles the bill on the aptly named ring billed gull. That makes it pretty easy to remember. On the California gull, we've got a red and black spot that's quite bold. And on the herring gull, we also have a red spot with sometimes a little bit of black on it. Now the iris color, on the ring billed gull, we've got pale. California is nice and dark and the herring is yellow on a you know pale colored iris. So if you're matching that that bill color and the iris color, that's going to be um, really helpful for identifying these three birds. Um, and they're ranked here from smallest to largest. We've got ring billed gull, ring billed gull as our smallest, um, California in the middle, and herring gull. The mantles are pale gray for both ring billed and herring gull, and it's darker gray on the California gull. But again, keep in mind um, that can be really tough to judge if you just have, you know, the one species or the one individual all by its lonesome. This is really, really helpful when you're comparing um, in a flock of birds. Um, likewise, with the with the leg color, um, ring billed gull is definitely on the yellow end of things. California can range from yellow to kind of yellow greenish. And herring gull is different than the other two in that it's got pink legs. And so that one's useful for, for picking out the different species. And just as a reminder, we do have that plumage variation related to age and time of year that I talked about. And these are images of immature birds. And so just to give you an idea of some of the ways that um, these different birds might be looking um, that are not quite adult birds yet and there's a lot of variation in this and we could probably go on for a very long time about identifying gulls and we probably want to bring in a gull specialist for that. At any rate I just wanted to give you a heads up that you might be seeing gulls like this um, even during the breeding season because they are not quite reached adult plumage yet. All right, now let's take a look at those tern species. Now again, those, those terns are gonna be small and slender, especially when you're comparing them to their cousins, the gulls. They've got narrow pointed wings. They tend to have nice pointed bills and they also wander to forage. First up is the black tern. This is one of my favorite birds, actually. It's a small tern with a straight black bill, and it's got a black body with really silvery wings, and that is really quite distinctive. You're not gonna um, mix up this bird with pretty well anything else. It's got a really buoyant and erratic flight above the water. It, it you know, sort of looks like a butterfly that's just fluttering around all nonsensically. Makes sense to the bird, but when you're watching it, it's just kind of this erratic looking flight. And these guys actually pluck insects off the surface of the water. And so you'll find them hanging out around wetlands where they nest colonially in shallow marshes. Um, so you'll see this nice kind of black and silvery looking tern um, flitting low above the water in the wetland. Um, Next up, we've got the common tern. This is a medium-sized tern, and um, it's got a, it's very similar looking to the forester's tern, which we'll compare in a second here. But the common tern has a straight red bill with a dark tip. Now again, bill color can be tough to tell at a distance depending on light conditions, um, but if you get it in good light, it is a, it is a fairly red bill. It's got a lovely little forked tail, black cap, and gray mantle and body. Um, this gray body, it's just kind of a grayish wash, and it can be difficult to judge, but if you do get a glimpse at it, um, that's a useful field mark because the forester's turn lacks that. So here we have an example of that kind of grayish wash on the underside here. And um, the upper wing is even gray, so the, the wing and mantle of the bird is just kind of this even gray color overall, and there's no contrasting white window, and that'll make a bit more sense in a second here when we look at the forester's turn. And these guys plunge headfirst in the water to catch fish, and, you know, turns foraging is one of the, always a really interesting thing to watch you know they'll they'll be flying around with their with their heads down scanning the water and then all of a sudden they'll they'll kind of do this hover in 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 place so kind of like flap their wings and be staring right down and then all of a sudden they'll they'll plunge they'll tuck their wings and they'll just smash right into the water and you know oftentimes they'll come up with um, a small fish or a small minnow and manage to get up and fly away and you know shake their shake their head off as they go and 
they're just really neat birds to watch if you if you find a good feeding ground for them they're they're quite interesting and they'll actually you know do you know bring um courtship gifts to their mates so that's that can be really cute to watch if you've got the female sitting on a you know i've seen this happen sitting on a log and the male just continually comes in and brings her little fish snacks it's it's really adorable um you'll find these guys over lakes and wetlands and they will nest colonially on the ground on loose substrate all right, so let's take a look at that similar forester's tern. It's a medium-sized tern. They're really similar in size and shape to the common tern. Now it's got a straight orange bill with a dark tip. So again, you know, you're comparing something that's red and kind of orangey red. So um, if you don't have ideal lighting, it can be tough to tell, is that orange, is that red? So, um, you know, color is one of those things that's always tough. It's got a black cap and that same kind of gray mantle. And they do have a bit more of a white window on the primaries, which contrasts with the rest of the wing and back. So you can see in this bird here that that darker back contrasts with the lighter primaries. Um, and that can be, you know, a subtle, a subtle thing. And, you know, oftentimes even expert bird watchers, um, you know, you're out there and sometimes you just don't have enough information to to make a, a judgment call um whether it's a forester's or a common turn and, and this happens lots with birds you know you just sometimes you don't have enough information and it's perfectly okay to say well it was a common or a forester's turn and i'm i'm not totally sure i didn't have enough information trust me this happens all the time um so again that that dark back contrasts with that kind of paler part of the wing. And you can see from this photo, it's got that nice white belly. It's kind of, it's lacking that gray wash like we had on the common turn. And these two will plunge headfirst into the water to catch fish. Um, also found over lakes and wetlands, and they will nest colonially in wetlands on muskrat lodges or other floating vegetation. So. Um, common tern will nest, you know, on loose substrate on the ground, and these guys um, definitely on floating vegetation or muskrat lodges. Let's take a look at those two compared. So the common tern on the left here has that gray belly, whereas our forester's tern is only going to have that that white. Um, it's not. It's going to be lacking that kind of smoky color on the belly, which again can be tough to tough to tell. And the upper wing um, for the common turn or you know the pole mantle and wing is going to be even gray overall whereas that foresters you're going to have that white window patch on the primaries which contrasts with the rest of the wing and back. And so that in a nutshell is telling those two species apart. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, at Birds Canada, we're always happy to help you learn to identify birds. And we have citizen science programs for all skill levels. Visit our website at birdscanada.org or follow us on social media to learn more or get involved. If you have any questions or comments about the video, you can reach out at skatlas at birdscanada.org. And lastly, do check out the Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas website at sk.birdatlas.ca and follow us on Facebook where we post links to upcoming workshops and other training opportunities. Thanks and happy birding!